right? Yeah, let me put this share the screen to introduce the speakers, let's just take and then we get started. Um, okay, perfect. So, hey everyone, uh, welcome to Multimodal with it. This is a webinar series hosted by uh, the team of uh, 12 apps. Uh, we meet every single Friday at 1 30 p.m. Pacific time. Um, you know, each week we hear uh, the list of topics that we tend to cover weekly. Um, you know, can be a research topic in multimodal AI to interesting application in different verticals. Um, since we focus on video, you know, sometimes we have people who talk about video projects that they like to share, as well as the infrastructure technologies, um, you know, that related to the, the work that they're building. Um, this is a list of speakers that we uh, invited in the previous session, um, you know, we're entering topics from uh, research in robotics to, you know, practice search to, um, you know, vector database and, um, you know, even multimodal data frame. So for today, uh, we have two speakers who will um, talk about, uh, the first speaker is gonna focus more on, on the um, industry application side, I think in the second speaker is focus more on, on the, the research angle. Um, so Evo Stranic is the head of product at Active Loop. And um, so I, I knew the Active Loop team uh, quite a while back, got connected with uh, the, the CEO, uh, David, uh, back in my previous job. And also, uh, you know, Mikael, the, the um, community manager, and we've been talking with them for a while. And um, he told me, like, you know, um, you guys are doing some super exciting work uh, to support uh, multimodal data with the deep leg open source project. And that's why, you know, we're going to have Evo today to talk about uh, a specific uh, tutorials on how to view an open source multimodal research app using Deep Light and the um, the Meta Image Pi project. And the second speaker is Gila Schaeffer, currently a PhD student at Tel Aviv University. Um, so I, I got a chance to connect with Gila uh, via email thanks to one of our um, community, community members, uh, uh, Nahid, who's also one of the speakers in the previous session as well. Um, so Gila uh, did some super exciting work currently in, in you know, vision language model. I watched her um, virtual presentation at CVPR just a few months ago, and um, recently she's published a new research work that focused on the underlying um, mechanism of diffusion model, which we will talk about in our uh, session today. So yeah, that's that's the agenda. And um, for the attendees, feel free to send your question in the chat, um, you know, and the speaker can answer them uh, asynchronously uh, after they finish, and then we'll have a, a, a short five to 10 minute Q&A uh, towards the end of our session once uh, both speaker finish. So yeah, uh, with that, good luck to have um, Evo start first and you, you can share your screen and uh, establish your um, presentation. So yeah, sounds good. Thanks for the intro. So just to be clear, we're doing Q&A at the end. So maybe I should do 20, 25 minutes. Hila will do the same and then we'll do like 20, 10 more minutes to end the hour with questions. Yeah, you do 20, 20 uh, 25 minutes and um, um, you know, if if like you finish a little bit earlier, and I can maybe reserve like you know two three minutes, but then uh, yeah, we will have like five ten minutes towards the end to, for both. Okay. 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 So. Cool. Yeah. Um. Th thanks everyone, and thanks for for joining the webinar. So my name is Evo. I'm the head of product at Active Loop. We're basically in the business of um, building data infrastructure that helps AI engineers ultimately build products that use deep learning models. And so today I'll be talking about building a multimodal search engine with ImageBind and DeepLake. And so I'm going to start with kind of a shameless pitch of the problem statement we see in the industry and our company, and then we'll get into the, the demo itself. So I think really what we've observed is that the current modern data analysis stack that was built you know roughly in the 2010s for for big data analytics is really not appropriate um, for generative ai um, you know data is is really the moat for a lot of companies currently there's a huge amount of data just sitting around on file systems cloud storage not being really used for a whole lot and then a small subset of that is um has been put into data lakes and then even smaller subset of that actually is being used in, in vector DBs and more uh, generative AI use cases. And so we want to basically enable you know, this, the, all of this data to be actually accessible by LLMs um, so that they can provide valuable insights on top of that data. And we believe also that you know, fine-tuning models is essential. Uh, I think currently not that many people are doing fine-tuning, but 
really as applications start getting productionized, this is going to become more and more important to really nail down the user experience and accuracy of whatever generative AI application you're building. And then we also believe that uh, multimodal is going to be really important, ultimately, because the data is multimodal. And, um, you know, we have different modalities of data because they're more appropriate for storing different types of information. Um, you know, you can an image says a thousand words, as they say. And so, you know, same thing with videos and, and other types of data. And so um, we want to make sure that LLMs also have access to the diversity of data that exists in the world. And, and the way we... The, the reason we say that the AI data stack is currently fragmented, it kind of looks like what you see on the left. So, you know, when building some product that uses AI or a deep learning technology, typically you start with some pre-processing, training, inference. Maybe you do this once and then eventually the system becomes a loop. And the challenge that we've observed is that at each of the stages of these different workflows, people are using different data storage, different data formats, and different tools. And really, it becomes the role of the data engineer to kind of string all of these things together. Oh, and also during all of these uh, processes and these different tools, you're basically copying the same data over and over and over again into your different applications. And it's both time consuming from like an infra perspective, and also just like it assumes that it consumes a huge amount of people hours just doing this work. And so we're trying to provide an active loop is essentially data infrastructure, uh, which in involves data storage plus a bunch of tooling, tooling on top of that storage that allows you to use the same data, the same APIs, the same you know, broader set of tools for all the stages of your um, ML lifecycle. And so, yeah, we're building essentially a database for all AI data. It's serverless. Key thing that we think is, is uh, going to be needed in this type of infrastructure is you need to have separation between your compute and your storage. Otherwise, you basically end up with a bunch of idle compute doing nothing most of the time. Um, we believe it should be multimodal because ultimately the data is multimodal. And then we believe that um, you know the, the, the tooling and the storage should be connected. Right now, you have the storage and then dozens and dozens of different tools out there. We provide a lot of these tools in the same solution, including, for example, streaming, querying, visualization, versioning data, et cetera. And um, DeepLake is loved by developers, trusted by enterprises. So we have tons of people in the Langchain community using it. Um, we've developed a Langchain course that's been really popular where people are learning about Langchain and about DeepLake and have really got awesome feedback all the way up to startups and then enterprises uh, such as Intel that are using um, DeepLake really to streamline um, their workflows and reduce the overhead um, for managing their data. And so in terms of why DeepLake, I think the key things I want to highlight that we have compared to some other um, vector databases is first, it's multimodal. Second, we provide a lot of um, tooling related to fine tuning your model. So from DeepLake, for example, you can run both vector search in a live application or actually fine tune a model from the exact same um, data lake. And then our deployment is serverless. And ultimately, this makes uh, DeepLake substantially more economical because you don't have fixed amounts of provision infrastructure that's kind of running idle all the time. And then we provide some of these other tooling like query engines and visualization um, on top of the service that we offer. OK, that's um, all I want to do in terms of talking about our company and kind of giving background. And then I want to actually jump into to what we built and, and really what the meat of this um, webinar will be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to Everyone can still see my screen, right? Yeah, I believe so. Oops. Can you still see my screen? Yeah, yeah, I see it. Um, so yes. what I'm going to do is actually just jump into like the final result, and then I'll kind of back up and um, we'll explain kind of how, how architecturally it was built. And then if there is time, I'll get into code a little bit as well. So this is the application that I want to show you. So basically, this application is a web app that enables you to do um, multimodal um, image search. So what we did is we took this um, Lexica data set. So this is a data set of images generated by Stable Diffusion. We uh, embedded it and stored it in DeepLake, our vector database. And then now in this, in this um, app, we can actually perform search against those images. But the cool thing about this is that this is uh, multimodal. So for example, if I drag and drop this picture of this fox here, Essentially, what we're going to be doing here is a similarity search um, against um, foxes 
um, from from the lexica underlying database that's in the vector store. And we can see that you know I, I basically input an image, do a similarity search of an image, and and this seems to to work quite well. Um, but the unique thing about this compared to just like a vanilla um, multimodal search is the model that it's actually using for the embeddings. So for example, I can add here another criteria in a different modality for the search. So I can search something like popcorn plus. So I'm, it's essentially going to do popcorn as text and then Fox specified as an image and then search that. And then now we see that we actually got, you know, not necessarily foxes, but the signal is there. Like we see these kind of animals that um, look perhaps fox-like, but then um, also we see this other feature that we specified as text, um, which is which is popcorn. And the reason this was all possible was the model that, that was used. You know, most models are kind of single modality models, um, but the model that we actually used to create uh, the embedding both of this like reference image and then also the embedding of the reference data that goes into the vector database was this um, image bind model by Facebook. So basically, the, and so this is a, the website from their model. There's also a really, really cool paper um, in archive. Um, I won't go into kind of huge amount of details here, but basically they've figured out how to take text data, audio data, heat maps, depth images, in, uh, videos and actually put them all into the same embedding space or rather a similar embedding space, irrespective of, um, you know, you know the, the, the modality. And that ultimately enables you to do this, this multimodal image search. And um, so, yeah, roughly speaking, like the way, the way architecturally this works, um, and I'm going to kind of dig into a little bit more into implementation, and then I'll go back uh, into the application um, to talk about some interesting, I would say, like artifacts that I think is really important to think about in, in Gen AI. But anyway, first, what did we do here? So yeah, we took the Lexica data set and then we created embeddings using image bind. This is now actually the Lexica data set um, in our DeepLake app. So this is app.activeloop.ai. When you create a vector database in DeepLake, um, you can basically visualize all of your data. And so here we see that we have 6,200 um, samples of these um, images from Lexica. And then if I click on one of these images, you know, it, you can see the path. Oh, I'm sorry, let me just refresh this. Something should have loaded here that didn't. Uh, you can see here the path from the image, its shape. And then, um, you know, here, here's the actual embedding vector. And then if you... We also have a feature that's currently in, in alpha, where actually you can look at those images in, in embedding space. So what we've done here is um, we've actually done principal component analysis all on those embeddings. And then this is essentially what, what the embedding space looks like of the model. And you can see your images and we're adding a bunch of features to this. So you can actually do similarity search in, U, in the UI and then run um, all sorts of queries. And then, um, yeah, the app itself, uh, basic. So, so we use the image by model again, and then the app itself um, was built um, in in Gradio, and and um, yeah, it, this is pretty easy to deploy. So we basically have DeepLake as the vector database. We have the app built in Gradio, and then the image by model essentially used one off to to create the embeddings, and then also do the live embedding um, for for this reference image, like in the app's backend. And then one other thing I wanted to kind of explore with you all is um, not, I don't want to necessarily call this like error proneness, but kind of weaknesses uh, of the model, so to speak, because I think it's really important uh, for folks to think about as, as they're thinking about like, you know, you typically you start at the prototyping phase, ultimately you likely want to productionize something. And so it's useful to think about like, when do we think um, this will not work? So, you know, here I've specified, um, the text is popcorn and the fox is the image. And as we saw, we, we saw some pretty good examples of um, things that, that appear pretty relevant to that search. But let's say, and that, and that happens because, you know, ultimately there's a lot of images with things with popcorn and, and animals, but let's say we do something else. Specify mushroom instead of uh, popcorn. Oops, sorry about that. So 
we specified mushroom as the text modality and the fox as the image modality. And we see if we actually look at our resultant images that they do in fact have mushrooms, like mushroom here, mushroom here, mushroom here. Most of these top search results um, have mushrooms, but actually there isn't a lot of stuff that resembles um, animals in here. And so, you know, this is this is a, a kind of a blind spot for the model because there aren't a lot of great results. But we we see that even though you know the results weren't great, they were very heavily weighted towards the text modality. So text mushroom and image fox basically gives you a lot of mushrooms. But if you actually reverse this, and I um, specify the text as a fox, but the image as a mushroom. Oops, excuse me. You know, now I'm back to getting basically a ton of foxes, but not a lot of um, mushrooms. And so it, it, even though the model is multimodal and it's putting everything into the same embedding space, that embedding space appears to essentially almost carry like more weight or more signal from the text modality than the image modality, because as we've shown, you know, when you actually don't have a great match, the text modality seems to be the one that's um, weighted very, very heavily. Cool. Yeah, that's actually pretty much um, everything I wanted to go to. I would actually love to, to hear questions. I know we're doing those at the end, so I, I'd rather kind of end early and give people uh, plenty of opportunity at the end to ask questions. So happy to follow that, that kind yeah. of work. Hey, awesome. Thanks for sharing the demo. Um, maybe you can also like ask any real time question for like the next two or three minutes, right? Because because you ran a bit early. So yeah, folks, if you have any real time question, I saw Nick at this opening. Yep. Hey, Bo. Thanks for sharing. This is really, really cool to see. Um, the question I have is more around your deployment. So you mentioned that it was serverless. Mm -hmm. Now, when you do serverless, there's a lot of limitations, like there's timeouts and things like that, that you don't have to deal with your, if you're like on a dedicated host. What was the, what were some of the limitations that you had to deal with while going serverless? And what was the decision making that kind of went towards going that direction? Yeah, so I think Let's see. So, so deep deep lake is deep lake can be interpreted as serverless kind of in two ways. One, actually, deep lake can run fully on the client side. So we actually you can use deep lake or rather the deep lake Python package as a vector store and pure just take the data, lay it out on your S3, and then run all computations from the client. So there's like no server involved. It basically any search that you perform actually executes on your machine. But that's you know not not super scalable because that ultimately you that you do kind of grow the computational complexity grows beyond what your client um, ultimately can support, and then that's where you need to actually upgrade to essentially a database architecture which uses our um, actual data uh, sorry deep lake open source package which kind of defines the data format and the computations and then adds our um, essentially computational service on top of that. And yeah, like it's definitely been hard to make it fully serverless and make it work. There's a lot more scaling challenges in terms of like how resources are shared, making sure that there's um, high availability. But you know what we've observed in using some other vector databases is that in both in talking to users and like we when we've run benchmarks is like we blink and like there's a huge bill and it's like why like there was this stuff running all the time and we, you're literally spending like thousands of dollars. So. Um, and I apologize, I can't give you a huge amount of technical details because I'm actually not, you know, su super in tune with what a lot of the database -y level, like super low level decisions are, but we've kind of like chosen to, to bite the bullet there and, and actually make um, something where as a user, you basically pay per usage and like we figure out behind the scenes, um, you know, where that's going to run, how that's going to run, um, but you're going to get the, the results that you expect. For sure, yeah. It, serverless, you get an exact idea of how many times it's been run. You can run multiple instances and let it scale infinitely. And it's it's great for that use case. Have you seen any, um, like, I am guess because there's like a, for AWS, there's like a 15 minute limit on how long you can run it. So there's computationally, you can't run longer jobs. So have you kind of seen different limitations are like maybe for video can't be processed within a certain amount of time or longer videos or images that are a certain size can't be like are those some things that you have to tackle with or or does the system adjust for all of those parameters 
You're referring to the 15 minute limit in like AWS Lambda, for example. Mm-hmm. I, I'm just assuming you're on Lambda, but no, yeah. no, no. That's so that's the thing. We're not like we're making it feel like it's serverless to you as the user, but you know we're not actually using like the AWS serverless offering under the hood. Like we're kind of we're we're building everything under the hood such that essentially we can offer it to you as something that that feels like it's serverless, where you basically pay per usage. But we're kind of twisting a lot of knobs of our own to like engineer things such that that that's ultimately possible. Oh, cool. So it looks like magic. It's like, you're not actually having to smoke in mirrors. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, now I just saw you have your, uh, your hand up. So yeah, feel free to ask your question. Um, hey, hey, Ivo. Hello. Yeah, so I was looking into when you are showing your demo, um, does it uh, currently work with other modalities like audio, um, yeah, the, the demo. here. Why don't yes. I? Why don't I? During the next talk, I'll try to um, maybe sure. maybe just questions. I can try an audio modality because it is in the sure. it is in the um, in the app here. I, we can actually take mm -hmm. a recording from. Maybe we can try something where I don't know somebody can speak in Zoom and I can record it and try to input it here. I don't know. Maybe some like a dog barking or something, and then we can see what happens. Let's do that after. Yep. Yeah, I was curious about that that one as well. Cool. Um, great. Um, perfect. Um, so, Hila, do you want to start? Um, I'm going to share the screen for your presentation. Yeah, sure. Um, not sure. Oh, okay. I do see an option to share my screen. Yep. All right. Can it. everyone see my screen? Okay, great. Um, so yeah, hi everyone. Uh, so as James introduced me, my name is Ilan and I'll be speaking about our recent paper, uh, The Hidden Language of Diffusion Models, which was conducted at Google Research as part of my internship with all these amazing co-authors. Um, so just another couple words about me. I'm a PhD candidate at Tel Aviv University, advised by Professor Leah Wolf, and also currently a research intern at Google, mostly interested in computer vision and multi-model learning. So, before we dive into the technical details, let's start off with maybe a motivation of what this work does and why it's interesting. So basically AI started with linear regression, right? And then linear regression was kind of self-explanatory because we learned to weight each one of the features in the input. Um, and then each one of the predictions could be kind of explained by the weights that we assigned to each one of the features. But then as the complexity and the number of parameters of the model grows, and especially when we're talking about generative models, it's not clear how to explain or what even an explanation constructs in these cases. So this is an interesting unsolved problem of how can we explain, how can we interpret, how can we understand these large models that are now being applied across all walks of life. So the goal of this work is to help you understand and interpret the predictions by your state of the art generative model. And just to give you some extra motivation, this is a conversation conducted with ChatGPT. And then we all know ChatGPT is kind of prone to uh, inherent biases, but this is an example of a gender bias by, by ChatGPT. And here ChatGPT cannot reason uh, around the sentence that an attorney is pregnant because ChatGPT believes that pregnancy is not possible for men. And if we're talking about an attorney, then an, an attorney must be a man and then a man cannot be pregnant. So these are kind of the inherent biases that are not always in plain sight, but do affect the predictions by the model, which makes it super important to try to understand and dissect these models, how they learn, what they learn, and how they uh, compose this information from nothing. So in this work, we're not going to focus on language models. We are going to focus on text-to-image models. We're doing multi-model learning, right? <laughs> so uh, text-to-image diffusion models take two inputs. The first one is a pure random noise latent, and the second one is text prompt. And then the diffusion model is kind of a black box that does some magic and takes each one of these pure random noise latents and converts them into diverse images that correspond to our text prompt. And as you can see here, uh, for a photo of a president, I got a bunch of images all describing presidents with diverse features that kind of fit my prompt. But then it's not really clear what's going on inside this model. So we can ask two main questions. The first one is how does this magic happen? How does the model map an input text prompt into these diverse images? And the second one, given the diversity of the images, there must be some kind of an internal representation inside the model for each one of these concepts. So the model must contain some kind of information about the concept president that allows the model to map the text prompt into the, those images. And this is what we're going to try to dissect in this talk. 
So again, before we dive into the technical details, I kind of want to give a spoiler alert of what the method can do. And as I said in the beginning, it's kind of hard to even construct an explanation or understand how an explanation should look like for generative models. So let's first try to break that down. So our method conceptor basically takes as input a textual concept, such as a president that we saw in the beginning. And then we generate a bunch of images that represent the concept from the model. And then given these images, the purpose of our, uh, our method is to decompose those images into the set of features that are manifested in the images. So for example, we can see here that all these presidents kind of look like interpolations of actual American presidents. And then we can see that this is manifested in the decomposition. So we have Obama, Lincoln, uh, Trump, Adams, Washington, Biden, Clinton, and then also features that have to do with where the president is. So it can be the White House, uh, the Capitol, inauguration, and so on. And then as we saw in the previous slide, different features can be manifested in different images, right? Not all the features are manifested in all the images. So we're going to want to be able to explain single predictions. So given a single concept image, so for example, this is a single concept image for sweet peppers, this is a single concept image for oak and so on, we're going to want to decompose this specific image to the set of features that drive the generation for this image and not for the entire concept. So here you're seeing some decompositions of single images using our method conceptor. Um, and you can see kind of cool decompositions that are corresponding to image features, to visual features versus just uh, textual features. So the correlations that are made by the model are not just based on semantic similarities in the text space, but we're going to touch on that once we're done with the technical part. This is just to give you a motivation. And then the final thing that we're going to want to do is, as I said in the beginning, uh, bias detection is so important and some biases are actually hidden. They are not really out there from just observing the images. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to test if our decompositions uh, can give away for free the features that are uh, the driving features of the bias. Okay, so this is something that we're going to want to test once we have that decomposition. So hopefully now we're fully motivated and again I'll get to all these use cases at the end of the talk you know, in, in length, but uh, I only wanted to give some kind of a motivation of what the explanation is constructed of. So let's dive into the technical details, what Conceptor actually does and how it does it. So the basic idea behind Conceptor is an idea that I think is very natural to try to interpret models. So the idea is just to mimic the training process of the model, right? If we want to explain something, let's see how it works. Let's mimic its training process and kind of try to accumulate the features or accumulate those uh, decomposition tokens as we go. So the first thing we need to do is kind of understand how diffusion models work. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with diffusion models and I'll be kind of boring most of you, but just to uh, get aligned on the same page. Um, this is the inference process of a diffusion model. And as I said in the beginning, it starts from a pure random noise. And then the model kind of gradually denoises the image until it obtains the clean image here that you see of the cat. And the thing that I do want to point out about this denoising process is that it adds features gradually from coarse to fine. So you can see that the features that are added here are the more coarse features, such as the shape or maybe the color of the couch in the background of the cat. And then as we go along the denoising process, the features that are added are more and more fine. So these steps will add the finer features, such as maybe the whiskers of the cat or the color of the nose of the cat um, or the stripes on the cat and so on. So this is going to be something that we're leveraging uh, with our method. And then, as I said, the goal is to mimic the training process of the model. So we saw the inference and now let's understand how the training process of the model works. So during training, the model takes two inputs the image and the corresponding text prompt. So this cute image of a cat and the uh, textual prompt, a photo of a cat, for example. And then what the model does is it adds a pure random noise to the image, but then it adds it and up until a specific time step that is also randomly drawn. You can see here that different time steps uh, manifest different noises. So the training process is going to kind of mimic the inference process by randomly drawing a noise and randomly drawing a time step and noising the image until this random time step. And then the diffusion model itself is going to just see this noisy image, this slightly noisy image or very noisy image, depending on the time step that we drew, and this text, a photo of a cat. And then the diffusion model actually learns to uh, predict the noise that was added to the clean image. 
So it doesn't predict the image directly, it predicts the noise, and then we can denoise uh, the image based on just taking the, this noise image and removing the noise that was predicted by the unit. And then the loss is just a reconstruction loss between the noise predicted by the model and the real noise that was added. Okay, we're done with the introduction. And now we can just jump right into Conceptor. So as I said, we're mimicking the training process. So the first thing that we're going to need is a set of images, right? Images to noise and then denoise and so on. So the set of images that we're going to take is a set of T concept images. So we're going to take a concept, a photo of a president, pass it through stable diffusion and generate T concept images to represent the features that are manifested in this uh, concept for, for the model, right? And in the case of the paper, we choose to uh, use the size of T as 100 images because we believe 100 images kind of represent the distribution of images by the model. And then what we're going to do is exactly what the model does during training. We're going to take this set of images, split them into batches, and then for each one of the images in the batch, uh, we're going to choose randomly a noise and the time step, and then noise the image based on the noise that we drew and the time step. So you can see that this image is slightly, slightly less noisy than this image. And then our goal is going to be kind of aggregating this set of features where each training step will add to the set of features, the set of features that is optimal to denoise these batch images. So for example, here we can kind of guess that maybe um, the feature that is best to denoise this image is Trump and the features that is best to uh, denoise this image is Washington. So we would expect this set of features to now include after this training step, Washington and Trump. So how does this magic happen? How do we aggregate this set of features? This magic happens basically with the simple MLP. This MLP is very lean, right? So it's just two layers with a nonlinear activation in the middle. And this MLP operates over the vocabulary of stable, stable diffusion. So because stable diffusion reasons around both image and text, it must have kind of a texting folder, right? So typically stable diffusion uses a frozen clip text encoder. And then the clip text encoder has a very, very rich vocabulary with 50,000 tokens. And then what the MLP does is it takes each one of these tokens and it learns to map each token to a corresponding coefficient. So each one of these tokens is going to have a learned coefficient that corresponds to it. And once we have this set of coefficients that we've learned, we, kind, we can kind of create this super token, where the super token is a linear combination of the entire vocabulary, where each token in the vocabulary is um, weighted by its learned coefficient by the MLP. So this is just a single token, where we weight each one of the uh, vocabulary items by its coefficient. And then instead of using a photo of a president or a photo of a cat, we're going to use a photo of a W star in order to denoise these images. And we're going to use the same reconstruction loss that was used during training. So basically this reconstruction loss is going to encourage the MLP to assign high coefficients to uh, the tokens that are manifested in the images and low coefficients to the tokens that are not manifested in the images. So after this training step, we would expect the coefficients for Trump and Washington to increase, while the coefficients, for example, for house and flower to decrease, right? And then since we have different uh, denoising steps, where each denoising step adds different features, as we said, from coarse to fine, each one of the randomly drawn uh, noises with the time steps will add different features from coarse to fine, such that this linear combination will contain a high coefficients for all the features, both coarse and fine, that are manifested in the output images. So um, are we done? It kind of seems like maybe this linear combination will assign high coefficients to the features that are manifested in the images and low coefficients to the features that are not manifested in the images. So the answer is that we're not really done because as I said in the beginning, this vocabulary is very big. It has 50,000 tokens and it is very expressive. So just to give you a sense of how expressive this vocabulary is, Kendrick Lamar, for example, is a single token in this vocabulary. It also contains emojis and punctuation marks. So the uh, domain gap between the 50,000 tokens and the embedding dimension of this token is very large because this token is only 1,024 um, uh, of the size. 
And then uh, this vocabulary has 50,000 tokens. And we all know from linear algebra that when we have 50,000 tokens and we want to construct a single vector, right, with the dimensionality gap that is this big, then we have many multiple combinations that can construct the same optimal token. So if we're talking about just this embedding, right, without assigning features. This embedding can be constructed by many different linear combinations. And then it's kind of taking away from the interpretability of things. Because one, we wouldn't know which decomposition is the optimal one or the correct one, because we have so many different uh, decompositions. And two, we kind of want it to be interpretable, right? So if we have 50,000 tokens in decomposition, it's not really interpretable to humans. You can't really iterate over 50,000 tokens and kind of reason about the features there. So what we're doing is we're adding another sparsity loss. And this sparsity loss is going to encourage the coefficients to be very sparse, such that most of these coefficients are going to be close to zero or absolute zero. And then only a small portion of these features are going to be larger than zero. And these are going to be the actual important features. So what we're doing is we're kind of forcing the MLP to only select the tokens that are absolutely essential to reconstruct the images, because otherwise this sparsity loss is going to be very high. And the sparsity loss is kind of constructed in accordance with how CLIP learns things. So CLIP uses the cosine similarity. So what we're going to do is we're going to demand a high cosine similarity between the token that is constructed by only the top end tokens, right? So this token is constructed by, again, the linear combination of the entire vocabulary only. Now we're considering just the top end tokens. And we're going to demand that this linear combination by the top end tokens is very similar to the a token that is constructed by the entire vocabulary. So essentially, even if the model wants to use the entire vocabulary, you kind of have this loss limiting it to just the top end tokens. And N can be controlled by the user. So for example, if you have a very complex concept where you feel that uh, you have a lot of features that are needed to kind of reconstruct the concept, you can increase N and vice versa. And we found that N equals 50 is kind of a good uh, starting point because it can cover both very complex concepts. And we do have also concepts that are super complex, such as elegance on a plate, where the model kind of generates different dishes or marketplace uh, colors in, of Marrakesh, where you have kind of a marketplace with tents and, and spices and so on. So n equals 50, yep, yeah, kind of usually covers uh, the entire diversity of the features that you need to reconstruct the concept. So now that we've kind of understood the method, so basically for each concept, we generate the images, uh, we learn this MLP, right? And then we only extract the top 50 tokens from the uh, coefficients that were learned as the decomposition for the concept. How do we evaluate that we even capture the entire features that are important to reconstruct the concept? So if we're doing is we're doing a reconstruction test. And as you can see here, we have three different concepts, doctor, bird, and happiness. And the top row are images generated by stable diffusion by the original model. And the second row are the images reconstructed by our decomposition, by our learned 50 tokens. So you can see that the images are quite similar and capture the features quite well, but they're not exactly identical. So notice that, for example, the doctor here has a glove while the, while the doctor here doesn't have a glove. So there are tiny, tiny kind of details that change, but the overall reconstruction seems to kind of preserve the features and the diversity of the features that exist in the original concept. So even when we're talking about birds where they have very specific features such as the color on the wing or the color next to the beak or the color of the chest, um, the features are kind of well-preserved. Or even when we're talking about kind of abstract concepts just, such as happiness, where we're not even sure what constructs happiness, right? Even if I asked you as humans, what is happiness? It would be kind of a, a hard question to answer. Even in those cases, we're kind of able to capture the features that are corresponding to the, to the concept. So now that we've understood how the method works and how we evaluate it. Let's understand why it's important or interesting or what the observations are that are derived from this method. So the first observation that we noticed is a high uh, uh, level of reliance on exemplars. So we did see that in the president's example, right? We can actually see that all these presidents are not exactly a specific president. They're not exactly Trump or Obama or Washington or Clinton but kind of interpolations of different uh, presidents. And we can actually see that manifested in the decomposition. And that doesn't happen only for presidents. So for rappers as well, which was kind of surprising because me, 
personally, visually, didn't really see any one of them as corresponding to a specific wrapper. But we did see that the concept of a wrapper kind of decomposes into names of uh, famous rappers such as Tupac, Drake, uh, DJ Khaled, Wiz Khalifa, The Weeknd, uh, Eminem, Lil Wayne, and so on. And also composers. So composers are decomposed into Schubert, Chopin, Wagner, Mozart, Beethoven, and so on. And the thing that to me is most interesting about this part is that uh, so far we've kind of focused on memorization in the context of just copying, right, input images or training images. We kind of tested whether or not the output images by the model are exactly identical to the training images. But this kind of implies that the model can also make memorizations that are kind of more complex or interpolations of input images. So maybe the concept of memorization isn't just copying an input image, but can also be interpolating two or three input images into an output image. So this is an interesting notion that is not clear whether or not it uh, is impacted by memorization or by uh, connections between different concepts and so on. Um, here's the second thing that we've done that I talked about in the beginning is single image decomposition. So now we have this single token, right, this super token that is a linear combination of tokens from the vocabulary. And then given a specific image, what we can do is we can reconstruct the image based on this linear combination and then gradually try to remove the features, meaning trying to zero out the coefficients of each one of the features. And then when a feature doesn't change the output image, we can just remove it from the decomposition. And then we're only remained with the features that are actually uh, influencing this specific image. And what we're seeing are non-trivial semantic connections that are not human-like, but also not text-like. So maybe we would expect that since the text encoder is frozen, then not a lot of information is going to be learned by the unit. But then what we're seeing here is that a lot of information is learned by the unit. And the information that is learned by the unit is actually image-based and not text-based. So as humans, we would never connect concepts like oak or stag, I think, personally. <laughs> but when we're seeing these decompositions, they kind of make sense. So you can see that the sweet peppers are decomposed into fingers plus pepper. So the shape of the fingers is the shape of the sweet peppers. And then you take the semantic features from the pepper. So it kind of becomes very evident when you kind of present it uh, visually like this. And the oak tree is decomposed into uh, the structure of the tree, the sequoia which just gives us the base of the tree and so on. And then the stag gives the semantic features of the tree. You can see that the color of the fur of the stag is actually the color of the base of the tree. And the horns of the stag kind of becomes the branches of the tree, which is funny and interesting. And a snake is decomposed into a host plus gecko, again, shape plus semantic features. Snail is a ladybug plus winding and so on. So again, really cool and neat observations that couldn't have been made otherwise. We wouldn't have known if the model actually learns to connect concepts based on uh, visual information or textual information. And this actually is a uh, direct indication that the model learns semantic connections that are not just based on text. Um, we can also decompose kind of abstract concepts. So as I said before, happiness, for example, is decomposed into children plus laugh. And you can see that the children here are kind of sad and not laughing. And once you add kind of the laughter, you get the happiness. So happiness is uh, ha happy children and fear is the screaming wolf and so on. So the third observation that we've made has to do with uh, concepts with dual meanings. So concepts such as crane, for example, can have two meanings. It can be the machine, right, the construction machine, or a bird. And then we notice that in the decomposition, we can see that uh, some of the features are corresponding to a specific meaning of the concept. So here in the decomposition of crane, we do have stork. And when we remove the stork from the image, we can see that the structure of the machine changes significantly. This kind of implies that the original input image kind of interpolated between the different meanings of a crane. So it generated a machine that is shaped as a bird's head. And when you increase the token stork, you can actually see the machine becoming the bird, where the uh, head of the bird is actually uh, where the machine used to be. And then when you remove stork, you can see that uh, we become, we, we get to the machine more and we lose the information from uh, the bird. Here is another dual meaning concept. So date can be either a romantic date or the fruit date. And then you can see that the date that is generated is kind of the fruit in the shape of a heart. When we remove the token dating from the decomposition, you can see that the fruit becomes more 
of the shape of a real date of the fruit, but it is still kind of organized in the shape of a heart. When we increase dating, we can see that the fruit becomes a heart. So again, interpolating two different meanings of the same concept. This also happens where you can see both meanings kind of clearly in the same image. So example, for example, big apple, you can see an apple with the background of New York City. Um, here you have a base or a bass, depending how you interpret it, how you interpret it. Um, and you can see a fish that uh, its body is kind of a, a bass guitar, which is funny. Um, so as I said in the beginning, another really important feature for us is bias detection. And we can see that the decompositions kind of reveal biases that are both biases that can be captured by the eye by just observing the images. So for example, we have secretary that is decomposed into wife, women, girl, ladies, which kind of gives away a, a gender bias. But then you probably would ask, why, why do we need this decomposition algorithm, right? We can just observe the images and see that most of the images or 99% of the images are women and then understand that there's a gender bias. So we've actually discovered that not all the biases are biases that you can just capture by just looking at the images. So for example, drinking is decomposed into kind of a set of non-trivial features such as cheating, millennials, blonde, drunk, booze and so on. So effectively what you're seeing when you generate an image of drinking is just a young person holding a cup of beer or something like that. But then when you decompose the, a concept, you can actually see the connection between specifically millennials and drinking. Um, this one is kind of triggering maybe especially for me as a Jewish person. Um, in the decomposition of journalists, we actually found uh, concepts such as journalists, uh, such as Jews, uh, refugees and so on. So these are biases that are not necessarily just easily observable by looking at the images, but then you can see the connections actually being made when you're decomposing and asking which features are optimal to denoise the images at each time step. And then uh, the final thing that we can do with our method is basically uh, fine grain concept editing. So each concept kind of has the decomposition with all the different features within it. So what we can do is we can increase and decrease the coefficient corresponding to each one of the features. So for example, we can see here an image of a professor and one of the uh, tokens in the composition is nerdy. And then we can see what the model constructs as nerdy in the context of this image. So when we remove the coefficient corresponding to nerdy, we can see that the hair of the person grows longer, the glasses are gone, the suit is kind of less tailored, it doesn't have a tie, and uh, the library in the background is gone. And as we increase nerdy, it, the person kind of becomes bold, the glasses are added, and the library in the background is added as well. Um, so here's another cool example that I think is kind of artistic. Um, in this concept sculpture, one of the tokens in the composition is abstract, and then we can make the sculpture more or less abstract by playing around with the coefficient corresponding to uh, the token abstract. Here are another a couple of examples with mountain where we can make the mountain more or less dolomite <laughs> And uh, if you've been to the Dolomites, it's actually pretty similar to the mountains in the Dolomites. And when you decrease Dolomites, you can kind of see more of an alpine kind of uh, view. Um, and then the president that we had here, so we can see that interpolation directly here, where you, when you remove Trump, it kind of looks more like Obama. And when you increase Trump, you can see that the features that are corresponding to Trump are kind of added back to the image. Um, so now that we've discussed all the different things that we can do with Conceptor, what's next? So there's a lot that we still do not understand, even though it kind of seems like we were able to accomplish quite a lot with not that complex of an algorithm. Um, oh, I see someone says this is hilarious. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's not me, it's the model. <laughs> Um, okay, so there's a lot that we do not understand yet and a lot of room for future research. For example, which information is coming from the text encoder? Because there is information that is coming from the text encoder. So for example, biases. Which of the biases are coming from the textual presentation and which, one are, which ones are actually learned by the unit? Um, where are these biases encoded and can we kind of remove them from the weights of the model uh, if we kind of locate them in specific weights? Um, are the generations actually interpolations of training samples, as I talked uh, before when we talked about interpolations of exemplars? Um, is it possible to kind of locate the training images that specifically triggered the interpolations of uh, 
of presidents, for example, or composers or rappers, and so many more questions that we may not answer. But I do hope this got you excited <laughs> about interpreting uh, diffusion models, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have right now. Fabulous. I think this, this is an excellent talk. Um, yeah, I, I think it was super interesting to, to see, like personally for me, see all this um, semantic uh, algebra, right, that, that you display, uh, like, you know, managing all this abstract concept. Um, it's super powerful as well in terms of like you taking biases as well as it, the last part of concept editing, right? You can, you can, as a, you want can manipulate the generated images with, yeah, using natural language query, which is super powerful. Um, All right, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, um, for folks in the audience, if you have any uh, questions for find out about this research, feel free to, um, yeah, ask them in real time or in the chat. Maybe I can I can ask something uh, in the meantime. Um, yeah, like I I, I guess like um, I guess well, well, what I, what do you think about some of the potential application of of this, this research in, in the real world? You know, um, how do you think um, some of the potential use cases for like you know people who want to implement it in like the yeah. artistic work? Yeah. Yeah, in general, uh, asking the question of interpretability and its applications is an interesting question because also when we were focused on classifiers, we kind of had those heat map methods to kind of show which uh, features in the image the model looks at. So the first thing that I would say is that um, we're kind of focusing a lot on applications and what we can do with it, how we can generate better images with it and so forth. But we're not really focused on actually understanding how the model works, which is kind of interesting to me because as scientists, we're kind of wired to be intrigued or interested about just wait a second how does this even work we're kind of taking it for granted right now but I do not think that uh, generating uh, images from text is, is kind of should be taken for granted for granted. Um, so the first thing that we can do is kind of gain a lot of observations on how the model works, which is really important in my view, especially if we're going to kind of employ these models. I know that we're all kind of focused on generating better images and kind of editing images and editing videos and so forth. But we kind of forget that these models are actually supposed to be implemented in the real world out there. You know, my grandma is supposed to use this an application that kind of uses this model in the background, my, my parents, my, my loved ones. And then it is kind of important to ensure that these models are actually basing their predictions on the, the right reasons. So this is the first thing that I would say is really crucial, right? Fairness and accountability. But then also uh, bias mitigation is possible when you kind of play around with the bias coefficients if you want to make the model safer. And then also uh, kind of editing the concept as I showed before, but then I would not want to take away from the main goal of this work, which is accountability and responsibility and kind of understanding these huge models that we're building and not just shoving uh, loads of information and loads of data into a bigger network to kind of get better FID. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, great. Evo, I saw you uh, unmute. I think you want to share something. Yeah, I have kind of a dry question. I think it was on slide like five or 10. There was a citation and in the citation in the title, it seemed to suggest that there was a concept from non-equilibrium thermodynamics that was used, like actually did part of my PhD in that field um, back back when I was, you know, doing more science stuff. Um, I'm just curious, like, do you know, do you happen to know like what concepts from that field made it into, into this? That's a very fascinating question. I actually had no idea that it had anything to do with anything but uh, diffusion models. But I do know that the original diffusion models were kind of inspired by the physics, by, by not by computer science. Mm -hmm. And then diffusion models only became popular in the last uh, year or so when they were used by, I think, OpenAI first. So it, it's not, you know, crazy to assume that uh, some of this information is coming from other fields of research, mainly physics, I think. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, awesome. Um, let's see. Well, I, I don't see any question for, for in the meantime by now. So um, yeah, Hila, if you want to share any additional resources for folks who want to you know, follow up and learn more about, about this work, uh, feel free to put some in the chat. 
Um, okay, sure. Yeah. And then Evo, I think uh, you were trying the uh, audio thing, right? For the uh, image, for the hub project. Uh, I it and I can't get it to work for some reason. Sorry about okay. that. Let me just try it one more time. Yeah, no um, worries. See what happens here. Yeah. Oh, on that note, Hila, I'm, I'm, I'm not working. Okay. Yeah, no worries. I think I I, I post something in the chat. So people can maybe try it out. On that note, Hila, I'm curious. Like if this, Jory searches on text to image. Like if we add an additional modality, let's say audio, do you think it can uh, it can still like you know uh, perform the explainability? Uh, yeah, procedure? definitely. Yeah. yeah, it should. It should. By the way, it's very robust. We actually tried to kind of experiment with uh, modifying the a set of training uh, images that we're considering. So taking another. Uh, feature and another uh, a random seed and then using that to create our set of images and it's very robust. So it kind of seems that the model learns the set, this set of uh, limited features that it kind of interpolates across the generated images and it seems to be pretty robust. So as long as you kind of mimic the training process of the model, I think it should work on any modality that you kind of uh, want to experiment with. Yeah, thanks for providing that context. Yeah, I think as because yeah, uh, as we get more modalities, I think I'm sure like the, the need for understanding how how these semantics concepts with each other is gonna all increase and having to your point a principal way of uh, you know detecting relationship and explaining them could, could be crucial in the long run. Yeah, I agree definitely. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I think we we're at the top of the hour now. Um, Matthew, yeah, I saw I, you. Can I yeah, go for can, it? Can I a quick question? Uh, Tuila, I'm curious, how do you measure the bias? Like, is there is a specific metric or is it just through visual inspection? Because I feel that oftentimes we talk about bias, but there is no like, like a proper way to measure it. And it's really hard to accommodate everyone. Like, it seems that everyone was want to be fairly represented in, in a good way. And it, it seems like a very, really like difficult problem even like from a human perspective so i'm curious yeah to... that's a fantastic question um so one thing that i've noticed is when a bias is very very prominent so for example for nurses you have a very very prominent gender bias of women and then you can kind of see that the same bias repeats itself with many different tokens as i showed in the secretary example uh, for example like ladies women uh women's so on so we would see a uh, high coefficients that correspond to the bias tokens and b the same biases are kind of repetitive across many tokens and then the level of repetition can kind of give you a sense of how strong the bias is and how influential it is on the generation and then one thing that is also cool about diffusion models is, as I said, they add features from course to find. So say you want to uh, find uh, gender biases, then you would probably just apply the method on the first denoising steps that are the coarser steps where the gender uh, information is added. And then you can see specifically the gender features added in this specific step. And then you can kind of analyze different time steps and kind of decompose each one of the time steps to see where each bias is manifested along the generation process. So that's also kind of a cool feature. But I would say that the basic thing is just examining the coefficients corresponding to the uh, biases and seeing if the bias is repetitive across the decomposition. OK. But how, how you define like the bias itself? Like, for example, uh, I think the, the nurse example is a very good example, because like in my experience, it like or like even when it comes to teacher it like in my experience women are more likely to do that kind of job in the same way like like on the opposite like if you, if i think about like construction worker i can mainly like picture men so they're kind of justified uh in some way it doesn't mean that all women like it like it's 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 universal but how how like how do you spot that something is not it doesn't reflect reality that that's a wonderful question i think it kind of has to do with social conventions um um i would say that for example 
having a feature like a blue uniform is not a bias for a nurse, right? Because that's just the uniform that the nurse that a nurse wears. Um, but then it kind of depends on us as a society what we define as biases. Um, and then some of these features can be perfectly fine. Um, like if I wanted to generate images of actresses, it implies that a woman is kind of one of the features that is included there. Um, but then the important thing I think is to kind of reflect to the users how the model represents a concept mm -hmm. and then allow the users using the model to kind of pick and choose where a bias is a feature and where a bias is really a bias. And it's up to us as a society to kind of define what are the okay. biases versus the features. Okay, thanks for the amazing explanation. Yeah, thank you. Great. Uh, well, I think we two minutes uh, over time, but uh, thanks both Ivo and Hila for this excellent uh, presentation. Uh, you know, work on uh, one is more on the open source, you know, industry of concern. The other one is more from a research principle, theoretical uh, part of view. Um, we'll have the recording of the session available in about one and a half to two weeks, and definitely share it with with everyone who questions to attend. Um, yeah, and uh, again, um, for for those who are new to the other series, we host it weekly, so we always gonna have speakers about multimodal AI. You know, Matthew will be here pretty much every week, so he knows. Um, yeah, so yeah, we'd love to see some some of you coming up, uh, joining in, in the next few weeks. Enjoy your rest of your weekend. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank Thanks. You. Thanks, Bye. folks. Cheers. Yes.